morning, church. How are you this morning? Good. Please open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 11. That's where we're going to be at this morning. We're going to look at verses 28 through 30, which I believe that these verses help us, the church, the people of God, have uh, a, a, an appropriate conversation about what it means to love and live all of life, all for Jesus. And so I'm really excited uh, about this today, and I just think it's a, it's a timely verse for this day and age. If you don't know who I am, my name is David Comstock. I am one of the pastors here, and uh, I'm a follower of Jesus and a Chiefs fan. All right, in that order. So do we got any other Chiefs fans in the house? No? Oh, no, this is, I'm going to hold you all longer for, uh, no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Uh, I I was laughing when Alex said he was going to get you out on time. It's not up to him, so uh, it's actually up to me. So, (laughs) No, we're in a series called Deconstructing, and what we're doing is we're taking a look at some common cultural beliefs, and we're seeing what Jesus has to say about those beliefs, right? There's there's certain philosophies and worldviews and, and truths and things that are going on out in culture, and you better believe that Jesus has something to say about those things. So last week, we looked at the idea of individualism, right? It was a product of the Enlightenment. It was this idea um, about the intrinsic worth and value of every single person, which is absolutely beautiful, but over time, it's become this complete worldview that was never supposed to be a worldview. And, and, And what we came to the conclusion of last week was that we need each other. Right? We weren't built or made to just be these individualistic people doing our own thing, our own way, and our own time, but we were built to live life together in community. That's actually how we best glorify God. Now, this week, we're going to look at our relationship to time. So last week, we looked uh, at a relationship with ourselves and one another. This week, we're going to look at our relationship to time. It's one thing that we all have in common, right? We all have 24 hours in a day, and we all have that same amount of time every single day. And so we're going to look at our relationship um, to that. Now, about four years ago, I took my uh, son Moses, who's eight now, on a uh, daddy-son fishing trip, right? Right? And that's like the rite of passage for every child, right? It's the mecca of fatherhood, right? To that moment to take your son and teach him how to fish. And listen, look at me. I'm not a fisherman, right? Like I I don't know what I'm doing when it comes to fishing. I just knew as a dad, I'm supposed to teach my son how to fish. And so I did. So we went to Walmart. We got our little Fisher Price fishing pole, our little Fisher Price tackle box. And I spent way too much money for something I'm only going to use once, but we did it. And I took him out to the lake and we we set up and I didn't know what I was doing, but I was telling my son, acting like I knew what I was doing, because that's what parenting actually is, right? It's just faking it until you make it type of thing. And so we get down and we put, you know, we 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 wire the see, I don't even know the lingo. <laughs> We, we get the hook up, we bait the hook, we do the whole thing, and I, I grab Moses, you know, in, you know, in between me, and I grab his little hands, and we go to cast the rod, right? And, and I, I don't know how this is going to work out, but we bring it back, right? We latch the whole thing, and, and I throw it out there, and I kid you not, it was the most beautiful cast I've ever seen in my life. Like, it was like, like just flying in the air that seemed like, it was like something out of field and stream. Like it was just beautiful. And all of a sudden the the, the, the bait and the, the hook and everything just like dropped on the water, which is that perfect, like plop. You know what I mean? Like it was just absolutely beautiful. It was just that moment. And I was like, yeah, son, like I got it. Your dad's got it. You know what I mean? It was, and he was like, oh, that's amazing. But I kid you not, that bait was in the water for less than half a second and a fish grabbed a hold of it. And so we both do what you do when you're a fisherman when a, and a fish grabs your hook. My son goes, ah, and I go, ah, you know, and I don't know what to do. And, and, uh, and, and we're sitting there and like, I'm acting like I caught like a blue marlin or something. I'm like, oh, you know, and we're reeling this thing in and we get it up and it's this, you know, little tiny fish that's there, but we're having a blast and it's the most amazing experience. Like everything I could have dreamed in my mind and my heart about a daddy son fishing day came to fruition in that moment and it was amazing so we take the fish off the hook we throw it back in the water and my son looks up to me and says what every eight-year-old son says when they do something amazing daddy do it again (laughs) and my heart just sank I'm like 
I, that's the first time I think I've ever done that to begin with, let alone like do it again. I don't know if I'm gonna be able to do this again. And so like, I'm like, son, whatever you want, I'm gonna do this. And so we do it, we bait it up, we throw it in there, it goes in. This time the, you know, the cast isn't so beautiful. It's kind of like you know, four feet out and we're just sitting there and plop and we wait and we wait and we wait, no fish. So my son starts to get antsy and we reel it in, move to another pond, we throw it in there and land it and we wait, we wait, we wait, no fish. My son starts to get a little antsy. I pull it over and, and we do it again and we wait and we wait and we wait and no fish. And finally I'm like, I'm getting my son this fish. Like, I'm gonna do it. So I take the pole from his hand. I'm like running around. I'm like climbing out on logs, hanging off of trees, like going around bushes, doing whatever I can. I kid you not, an hour later, I'm out there trying to catch a fish and we don't. And then I notice, my son's not around me. I'm like, what is going on? And I look over and my son's sitting on a log with his hands and his he's crying. And he's just, he's just weeping, like crying. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I gotta catch this fish. And I go, and I'm like, Moses, I promise I'll catch a fish, you know? And I'm going out there and go, and he's still crying. And I go back and, and I'm like, Moses, I promise I'll catch a fish. And he goes, daddy, I wanna go home. And he's like, I'm like, son, I'll catch you a fish. And he's like, no, I wanna go home. And I'm like, I promise I'll catch you a fish. And then he looks up with me with this sad little face and he goes, daddy, I don't care about the fish. I just wanna be with you. And it was just this like, sweet little moment where I realized something. I was spending so much of my time trying to accomplish a task that I missed the purpose of the task altogether. And I wonder for us if our Christian lives can be kind of like that. You know, we, we, we run around and we're so busy doing things for the Lord, for our family, for life, for accomplishments or whatever. And, and in the end, we get so caught up in a hurried, distracted, busy life that we might be missing the purpose of it all. You know what I mean? And, and that was just a, a, a defining moment for me because I missed the point. And, and, and I know that the life that Jesus offers us is not one of anxious toil and fruitless labor. It's not one of, of hurried and task driven. It's one of peace. And in that moment, I couldn't be present with my son, right? And, and, and I wonder if Jesus came, the one, the Emmanuel, the one with us, and, and, and the thing that he accomplished most perfectly on the cross was not just the forgiveness of sin. It was not the wiping away of our sin, but it's the sin that kept us from having a relationship with God. It was the sin that separated us from God. The purpose of Jesus dying on the cross was to do something about the thing that separated us from the good, good father of all creation so that now by Christ, through the power of the Holy Spirit, you and I can move closer and be present with God once again. That's the point of the gospel, relationship with the one who made you. And so I wanna, I wanna talk about this life of rest that Jesus invites us into. How do we live at peace with God, ourselves, and one another in an age of anxiety and hurry? How do we do that? Because I'm telling you, that's what Jesus is offering us into. Now, we're gonna look at this passage, Matthew 11. There, there are uh, theologians and, and teachers and pastors and philosophers that look at this passage and say, this passage um, in it provides us the secret to the spiritual life, right? The, the John 10, 10 abundant life. Like I have come to give you life and life abundantly. I have come for, it's for freedom that I have set you free. This life that Jesus offers, a lot of theologians will look at this text and say, the secret to that spiritual life that we're all longing for in our hearts is found in this passage. So I wanna, I wanna read this together and look at it. It says this, come to me. And Jesus talking to the crowd, to the masses, to, to, to the broken and needy world around him. He says, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And he says something interesting. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your weary souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, if you've paid attention at all to culture, you'll probably recognize that the pace of the world is speeding up. You know what I mean? Like, it's just, 
It's, it's, it, culture is speeding up. And, and the problem with, with the speed as, uh, up thing is it seems to be leaving a, ma- a vast majority of us in society having to learn how to live with the, like this low-grade fatigue and anxiety that, that if ever, like hardly ever goes away if ever. You know what I mean? This like low sense of just fatigue and anxiousness about the future or what's to come or, or just tiredness or can I do another day or whatever. And as we advance in technology and we advance in the efficiency of being able to produce more goods, the demand on us seems to be this, do more, be more, accomplish more, be better, try harder, doesn't it? Right? There's, there's like things that I didn't even know I needed to do until Pinterest came out, right? Like, it's just that like thing, like social media is like place these demands on us that I didn't even know were there, right? Until I put my eyes on them. I'm like, dang, I need to have a better Christmas tree or I need to, you know, have a better lawn or whatever the, the you guys don't have lawns out here, right? That's right. <laughs> But this is fatigue and anxiety that we do. In the, in the 70s, they did a study trying to figure out the effects of rapid technological growth in developed countries, and they came to this conclusion. They said technology is, is advancing at such a rapid pace that we are predicting by the year 2020, the average American will only have to work 20 hours a week. You guys are laughing, right? It's humorous, right? Because it doesn't seem like we're working less. It seems like we're working more, doesn't it? Like, the, the, you know, now we have, you know, what we used to do, doing dishes by candlelight, right? We throw in the dishwasher and have seven more tasks we need to do and have filled that time in that space. It's like the more technologically advanced we get, the more we pile on, the more demands of the world, the more expectations of, uh, of the world and one another and ourselves that just come on. On us, and I love Eugene Peterson's paraphrase of this passage. He says it like this He says, Are you tired? Are you worn out? Are you burned out on religion? Come to me, get away with me, and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. Here's what Jesus says. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and light. You see, we live in a culture where people hardly ever talk about this fatigue and anxiousness, but it's always there. What do you do when you say, hey, how are you doing? What's the common response? I'm great, everything's great, I'm just busy, right? That's what people say. Oh, great, I'm just busy. Yeah, things are good, I'm just busy. You know, life's going really good, I just got a lot on my plate, right? We just have stuffed our plates so full with the demands of the world and I can relate. There was a time as a pastor where I used to read this passage and weep over it. You know why? Because I knew that the life Jesus was offering me was not the life I was experiencing. There was a disconnect between this passage, even for a pastor, and the life I was actually experiencing in in, in my everyday life, right? Because I would run around like a chicken with my head cut off trying to meet everybody's demands and trying to be everything to everybody all the time. And I would keep my life so busy and I would end up doing all the things that Jesus never asked me to do and neglect all the things that Jesus so beautifully invited me into. And that's as a pastor. This is the life we we have all of these demands and all of these expectations that Jesus never put on us. Dallas Willard came to the conclusion that the great enemy to the spiritual life is not liberalism or sexual immorality or greed or you fill in the blank, but the greatest enemy to the spiritual life is simply hurry. Hurry. He wrote this about this passage. In this truth lies the secret to the easy yoke. The secret involves this, living as Jesus lived in the entirety of his life, adopting his overall lifestyle. You see, our mistake is to think that following Jesus consists in loving our enemies, going the extra mile, turning the other cheek, suffering patiently and hopefully, 
while living the rest of our lives just as everyone else around us does. It's a strategy bound to fail. And here's what Dallas Willard is saying about the tension in this weird Western Christianity is we want to have the life of Jesus and... We want to have the life of Jesus and the life of our neighbor. We want to have the life of Jesus and that one person on Instagram. We want to have the life of Jesus and, right? And we treat Christianity like this thing where I can go and pursue everything I want. And then if I just can sprinkle a little bit of Jesus on it, it'll make that thing better, right? But here's the thing is when Jesus goes after a person, he's not just asking for a part of you. He's asking for all of you. Jesus does not want to share your heart with anything else. He wants everything, and he promises that if you give him everything, he will be everything for you. That's the promise of the gospel. You see, the Jesus and theology is disrupting our lives, and and, and what happens with the Jesus and is we're trying to live up to the demands and standards of the world while also trying to live the life that Jesus has for us, and it's a weight that's too much for any person to bear, and so it leaves us frustrated and depleted and fatigued, pretending and performing that we're experiencing the life of Jesus while never having joy in our walk and in our life and in our Christian faith. You see, if we want to experience the life of Jesus, we must learn to adopt the lifestyle of Jesus. And that's what we're going to look at today. The good news about Jesus is not just about what happens to us when we die, but it is an invitation to truly live. Listen, you're going to hear me say that a lot. The truth that Jesus invites you into, it doesn't just talk about afterlife, going to heaven or not going to hell. Jesus' heart for you is not some place, right, that, that, that you might go. The whole point of, of, of the gospel is to be with Jesus and have life and find life in him. And so he says, come to me. I love this phrase. In the Greek, it's, it's, it's this urgency. It's like him saying, come over here, move close to me, like, like lean in. The thing that, 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 that is lost in your life, the thing that you're looking for, it's found over here near me, which means that we cannot have life in Jesus if we don't have proximity with him. Right? We need to learn as the people of God to move closer, to lean in, to have presence and proximity in our lives. We need to be near the one who offers life. Could you imagine, like, I, I think oftentimes our relationship with Jesus is philosophical and not actual. Could you imagine if I was like, I sat down with my wife and I philosophically explained to her why getting flowers for her would be really, really good. And then I never got her flowers, <laughs> right? How annoying would that be, right? At some point she would be like, listen, knucklehead, just buy me some flowers. I don't care why it makes me feel good, you know? Like, just buy me some flowers. There's this thing that we do with Jesus where we leave him over there and, and we talk about him, right? Like he's not in the room, like he's not a person, like, he, like he's not the Emmanuel, he's not the God with us. And Jesus is saying, Psst, move closer. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden. And then he uses this really interesting phrase, take my yoke upon you. It's interesting because Jesus uses a work tool to be the vehicle for rest. A yoke was something you would put on an ox or a cow to like go and do work in the field. You would attach um, work, like, like farm tools onto this thing. And in an agrarian culture, they would have looked at this and been like, yoke and rest? Like those things don't match up. But it's really funny because it's not that Jesus is saying rest is without work. He's saying the type of work that we do in Jesus is like rest when you compare to the type of work you do in the world living for the demands of the world. Because listen, at that time, the heavy yoke of culture was the massive taxation of the Roman Empire, right? They would work and they would work and the Roman Empire would come in and take everything they had and they could never get up, right? They could never get ahead under, under the rule and reign of the Roman Empire. There were always more for them to, 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 to have to do and more money that they'd have to give. But it was not just the Roman Empire. It was also the unattainable demands of the religious culture. It was corrupt. 
You had to off, bring more offerings. Your offerings wasn't good enough and you had to do it more often and all of these things because they wanted the money, right? There was corrupt. And so they had the Roman empire and the religious people of the day putting all of these demands on them. And this is what Jesus is saying. My invitation to you is to carry your life differently. Carry your life differently. The secret to the easy yoke is this, and this did not originate with me. The secret to the easy yoke is to learn to ruthlessly eliminate hurry from our lives. See, Jesus was never in a hurry. There's only one time in all of scripture that it shows Jesus or depicts Jesus in a hurry. One, it's by the, by the author Mark, right? Who was kind of that way anyways. He was kind of just quick and to the point and just you know, wanted to get the story out. And I, I say Mark couldn't wait to get the gospel. Like he couldn't wait to get to the cross, right? And so he's just like, Jesus in a hurry to get to the cross, right? That's the one time in all of scripture. Every other place in scripture, Jesus is not in a hurry. He is not allowing the cultural demands to dictate the pace of his life. He won't do it, right? Even to the point where his best friend is dead, right? And they're coming to him like, Jesus, come on, come on. And Jesus like, I'll be there when I get there. You know, like people are hungry. The disciples are wanting to get out of there and, and go and eat. And Jesus is like, no, we're not just gonna take off and hurry off to the next thing. Why don't you just take this boy's little ancient Lunchable and feed the, you know, the whole crowd with it? Like he wasn't in a hurry. See, we live in a culture that's chewing up our time with constant noise and distraction. And Jesus says, there's one thing I ask of you. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And listen, here's the thing about that command. And, and John Ortberg says it beautifully. He say, love and hurry are fundamentally incompatible because love always takes time and, one, and, and time is one thing that hurried people don't have. You see, the uh, American Journal of Psychologists uh, introduced a new phrase a few years ago, and it was this, hurry sickness. It's an actual thing. Hurry sickness by dictionary.com says a behavior pattern characterized by continual rushing and anxiousness. And then psychology today uh, uh, expounded on that and said it's, it's a malaise in which a person feels chronically short of time and so tends to perform every task faster and to get flustered when encountering any kind of delay. <laughs> Does that sound like anyone? Right? Like, I'm mad at Chick-fil-A when they're closed on Sunday. Like, <laughs> you know, they're getting in the way of my life and my needs and my, you know, it's just like this constant thing. They say three symptoms of hurry sickness are this. One, you move from one checkout line to another because it's shorter. Two, when you come to a stoplight, you begin to count the cars ahead of you and change lanes to the one with the least amount of cars. Three, you multitask to the point where you forget one of the tasks. Here's what just happened. We all just had to self-diagnose self -diagnose ourselves with hurry sickness, right? We have it. Hurry is a form of violence to the soul and we need to look at it. So what is Jesus inviting us into? I think there's four concepts that I really want us to think about when we leave here today. And they're not demanding. One of them is just the idea of Sabbath, the fourth commandment, right? Before all the morality stuff, Right before we get to like, don't covet your neighbor's wife, don't covet his stuff, like, like don't commit adultery. Before we get to all the like moralistic type of things, the God says this, don't put any other gods before us and learn to be a people who rest. Why? Because Sabbath best reflects what the goodness of the gospel offers us, grace right? The grace doesn't say do more, be more, try harder. Grace says I've done everything that needs to be done on your behalf so you can rest. You don't have to try to get to God. God has come to us. This is the beauty of the gospel. Sabbath is the alternative to the endless economic and emotional demands on us where we take one day a week and we say, stop, I'm not doing it. I'm not gonna, I, I'm gonna remove myself from the stream of the social and cultural demands and just find rest in God. I'm gonna thank him. Do you know that Sabbath is one of the main themes in all of scripture? It starts in creation. 
right? God worked six days and then rested on the seventh. And do you know that he created man on the sixth day? So that means the first day that you and I ever lived, that humanity ever lived was one of rest, which means this. This means that God's design for us is for us to work from a place of rest instead of constantly feeling like we have to work for it. Do you know what I mean? That constant feeling of, oh, I can't wait to get to Friday. I can't wait to get to vacation. I can't wait to get to retirement, right? We're just toiling, right? They're eating the, the, the bread of anxiety and anxious toil where we're just trying to find rest. And God's saying, that's a product of sin. Actually, my design is for you to work from a place of rest, from you to work from your identity and not for it. You don't have to prove yourself to God because God made you. He doesn't need proof, right? He made you. He created you. He designed you perfectly. He knitted you together in your mother's womb. He knows you perfectly, your darkness and your light, your hidden secrets and the ones that are out there. He knows everything about you. You do not need to prove yourself to God. Jesus is the only proof that he needs. That's Sabbath rest. And then when, when Moses went on Mount Sinai, remember he had to reestablish the, this idea of Sabbath and brought in the commands? You know why? Because the life under Pharaoh was rough, man. It was work, work, work. And, and, and Pharaoh was going to require or demand more of the Israelites while giving them less resources to do it. Remember when he put them in slavery and made them made bricks? Right, where he's just like, you're just gonna work harder, work harder, work harder. Oh, and by the way, you have to go gather your own straw. We're not gonna provide it for you anymore, but I expect you to do more. And when they came out into the wilderness, God was reestablishing life under his rule instead of Pharaoh's rule. It wasn't one of more, 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 more. It was the one of rest, trusting God. Remember the manna? You can gather it six days. And look, if it makes you happy on the sixth day, you can gather twice as much, but on the seventh day, rest. And then Jesus comes out and he confronts, right, the broken concepts of Sabbath in the world where religion was trying to make Sabbath about, you know, about being self-righteous and, and doing more religious stuff so that they made more money in the temples. And Jesus is like, uh-uh, that's not what Sabbath is about. He reclaimed it. And listen, Church, we in our fast-paced culture need to reclaim Sabbath, a place of rest. The first rhythm in the creation story, when, when I read that and, and think about what does it look like to live life according to the rhythms of God's grace, it's one of rest. That's what the gospel message is. The guilt, the shame, the burden, all of that is taken away from Jesus, by Jesus. Bring it to me. You don't have to live under the condemnation and the demands of the world around us. And then the second thing is silence and solitude. Listen, we live in a weird age where we don't know ourselves anymore. We don't really know who we are because we're never alone. You're like, yeah, I am all the time. Yeah, I'm, I'm always alone. And I just scroll on Facebook or, or Instagram the whole time. You're not alone then, right? We, we always have it. Remember that thing in the 90s called boredom, <laughs> right? Where like you didn't have phones or, or glowing screens to look at when you were standing in line. Like you actually had to sit there and think about, oh, what kind of person am I actually? <laughs> you had to be confronted with your own stuff instead of just looking for an escape where you couldn't binge watch on Netflix, any show at any time, right? You had to wait a week for your favorite show to come out again. And heaven forbid we ever went to the bathroom alone again, you know? <laughs> you guys are all TMI, David, TMI. <laughs> See, Je Jesus never let circumstances or other people's expectations dictate the pace of his life. He let the rhythms of the grace of God determine his life. And then this slow down, you know, I, I love this phrase. It says, it's in our limitations where we find God's will for our lives. I want you to think about that. It's in our limitations where we find God's will for our lives. Do you know that you were created before sin to need rest? Or how about to need air and oxygen? Or how about to need food for sustenance? Or how about needing real interpersonal relationships where you actually know one another and you're known by each other? Did you know that you were created with limitations? 
And this whole like weird, like there's this new like weird uh, prosperity gospel that's just like the limitless gospel. Like you can do anything at any time. And it's like, no, that's not true. God can do anything at any time, but we need rest. We need to slow down. We need to dictate the pace of our lives so that we make room for God in it. And then the final thing is this idea of simplicity. Do you know that um, one of the fastest growing companies in the West is storage? (laughs) It's a multi-billion dollar industry because we have more stuff and more maintenance and we need to work harder for more storage and more space, more, 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 the greed, right? We got this insatiable hunger for stuff and so we try to fill it and really what it is, it's this eternity that God's put in our hearts and our restless hearts will never find rest until we find it in him. We need more and and simplicity says no. Right, bracing simplicity allows us to get away from the life of maintenance and and, and start experiencing the life that mission has for us, this life of purpose, mission over maintenance. Jesus lived a very simple life. He he had a tunic and says, I don't know if you wanna follow me because there's, I don't even have a place to lay my head, right? Like Jesus made Joshua Becker look like a hoarder, right? (laughs) Like. You actually need to read his book. It's really good because the whole concept is not just about getting rid of stuff. It's about making room for important stuff. Like that time with my son, what was really important, making room for God. And look, I, I know that there's people in this room. I'm not dumb. I know there's people in this room that are like, yeah, whatever. And that's fine. But listen, I know there's some people in this room who are experiencing exhaustion and worn out and a sense of bankrupt in emotions. I have nothing less, a a, a sense of numbness to the world around us where we're we're numb to our spouse and we're numb to our kids and we're numb in our work. I know there's people in this room that are tired and broken and worn out because I've been there. Look, the invitation for you is come to find rest. Move in, lean in to Jesus. Get get proximity thing down in in your life. Open up space and rhythms in your lives where you'll be able to move closer to where Jesus is when it comes to this stuff. And look, I know there's people in this room right now who feel the weight and the condemnation of their sin. They've never confessed their, their, their need for Jesus in their life, and they're feeling the weight and the shame and the guilt of that. Listen, your invitation for you today is to come near to Jesus. So wherever you're at, if it's, if it's feeling the guilt and the shame of your sin, or if it's just feeling the, the, the burnout and, and the tiredness from the endless demands of the culture around us, the invitation is the same. Come to Jesus this morning. We're going to have people here that want to pray with you that want to pray with you. And if, if, if uh, here's what I, I recommend. If, 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 if the second category of people, you're in there, don't leave this place without having someone pray with you, without acknowledging someone, without sharing with someone that I'm tired and worn out and need Jesus. Please don't leave this place today. Let me pray. Father, I love you. God, we need you. God, help us to have a cadence in our life that represents who you are. God, I pray that the peace of the kingdom of heaven would fall in our hearts this morning. God, that we would find rest. We could stop laboring for that which you've never required. So that we might experience the joy you so desire to give us.
God, we love you. We praise you. We thank you. In Christ's holy name, amen. Guys, thanks for worshiping with us this morning. May you go and be blessed.